The year is 2002, and the NASCAR Busch Series field is one of the most competitive in history. It's an eclectic mix of young guns and savvy veterans, duking it out for the ultimate prize of a giant silver trophy and an immense cash payout. Every car is adorned with the logos of large companies, Cup Series drivers are allowed to race without restriction, and there's even Pontiacs. It was a simple time. It was a better time. It was a time when the stands were packed and the money flowed like raindrops on a plate glass window. Terrible domestic light beer just tasted better back then. This is the 2002 Hardee's 250. Hey everyone, and welcome to another edition of Swig That Gatorade, Mark. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Flashback to the Track with your hosts, Mark and James. I'm James, and joining me, as always, via a remote location somewhere on planet Earth is Mark. How's it going, Mark? Canada. I'm in Canada. Oh, okay. It's What's the board country, say today? Though, so. It is. It's May 1st today. It's, it's May, May, May 1st be with you. It's I already wanna... It's already May, which is crazy. It, it, I, this year has been flying by. What's, what's funny is I feel like this year has flown by faster than we have anticipated, even though we have been in uh, solidarity for like probably almost two months. Yeah, two months. So what's that like? Uh, like at least a third of this year. So that's awesome. But whatever. I don't know. But There's, there'll, there'll be more next year, I guess. We've been we've been killing time by recording podcast episodes and uh, doing our thing. I've been spending an unbelievable amount of time on Twitter, which is both good but mostly bad. Especially if you go yeah. on like deep dives about the current state of affairs in the world. But we're here to talk about NASCAR today. So not just any kind of NASCAR, the best kind of NASCAR. NASCAR Xfinity Series Racing that I will be corrected right now because people are going to be like, it's the NASCAR Bush Series. It's not the Xfinity Series. Mark, I think we could both agree. It's, it's still the Xfinity Series. It is, but we can say the term Bush, I guess, that today oh, yeah. because like it was the Bush Series at the time and it's just easier to say Bush because it's one syllable instead of three. Or I four, don't have a actually. Bush, though. Uh, it depends how long you enunciate the shh. It could, could, could vary, but... True. But we're talking about the best Bush Series time, too, the early 2000s, back when everybody had massive sponsorship on their cars, cup drivers could run as many races as they want, and you had more than 43 cars show up for every race, and it was a very competitive time, you know, and we had, we had like, veteran full-time Xfinity guys, which I guess we still have now, but... Uh, a lot more in those days. Guys who were never really interested in moving up. They just made a living in the Bush series. Yeah, it's interesting you say that because you got a guy like Randy LaJoy. Is, he's a great example of, of a Bush series driver, two-time champion, who even said at the height of his career when he was in his championship runs that he didn't want to go to Cup. He liked what the Bush series gave him. Gave him a good schedule, was able to be with his family. He was able to be a star in in this level or you know area of stock car racing, and he still had that in the early two thousands. And with that, he had big money coming in. So look at all these these sponsors, Mark. Geez, there's so many corporate yeah. names on these cars. It's pretty crazy. Like just looking at the at the uh, racing reference page. Um, thank you, by the way, to racing reference. This is how we do everything. Yeah, thanks to your mask our man for racing reference. Awesome. Uh, my favorite sponsor, I gotta start off, is Stacker Team, man. It's the world's strongest fat burner. Yeah, do they still sell it? If, yeah, probably if you go to like a gas station or GNC. Um, yeah. I feel like fat burners are still a thing because like, you know, I mean, people still. Oh yeah, people still buy hydroxy yeah. cut and stuff like that, right? So. But that man, that was a time too, because like those, all those sponsors never came to the Cup Series. They're like, we're fine with spending our money in the Xfinity Series. Yeah, and there's lots of other ones too, man. Like there's like Kleenex and and Nestle, Nesquik, and Albertsons grocery stores, and Net Zero, MBNA, which is a credit card company, Excedrin, which is another uh, pharmaceutical brand. Uh, the U.S. Marine Corps. At, at, this was a time in NASCAR where every single arm of the United States, like military, had sponsorship on cars. Like they all had different cars, and the Marines sponsored a car primary sponsorship the full year uh, in in the Bush Series at the time. 
but just some of the other ones too, like AC Delco and G- GNC, which you mentioned forever. And GNC yep. sponsored like six bush races a year. Like every yeah, bush race was the GNC that. Live Well 200, like pretty much. Yeah, imagine imagine like working on like a team that was like sponsored by uh, GNC. Like, did you get like free supplements with that? Like, did you get like a supplement package every race? Because GNC was trying to be like, yeah, we need to make sure our, our crew guys are buff. Our guys work on our car are buff. Um, yeah, yeah, Toys R Us. That's, that's a Fortune 500 company. Toys R Us. Uh, Granger, which is a huge equipment uh, catalog and uh, like ordering company for for big corporations. Channel Lock Tools, Nestle brand uh, was specifically Nesquik and Nest T. They sponsored in the Xfinity Series for a little bit. It's uh, it's just like crazy to see that well, a lot of these sponsors, a like we said, never made it to the Cup Series or never sponsored in the Cup Series, but also b a lot of these sponsors aren't even in NASCAR anymore. I feel like they're they're not interested in putting that money to market in NASCAR anymore. They've have other things they have to address. Cause you know, a lot of things have come up since 2002, like social media and the internet, you know, that kind of advertising takes away. Yeah, definitely. And it's, it was always interesting to me just to see all these sponsors that, that like you said, would stay in the Bush series and not move up to cup because I guess they were happy with the level. Cause I assume that obviously the sponsorship dollar amount is going to be smaller to sponsor a Bush series car than, than a cup series car. Um, but there was a lot of eyes on the Bush series at this time. Lots of people watched it. Uh, it had a good TV package, so it was very well done. But even with all the cars that managed to find massive sponsorship, poor old Scott Wimmer has to drive an unsponsored car around for half of his career. Cause for some reason, the marketing department of Bill Davis racing was not pulling their weight. So. They're too busy trying to kiss the the heels of uh, Caterpillar. They're trying to uh, like a please to that sponsor because I don't get it. Like what they had Janet King on there for a little bit, and then after that they just had the Janet King flames on mm-hmm. the car for like the whole year. Janet King sponsored a lot of cars for a lot of years. What is Janet King? Is that like it's a, a cleaning, cleaning service? It's, it, yeah, it's a cleaning service. It's like a commercial cleaning service. Okay, so if, like I need to commercially clean up dead bodies called or called you need Janet. like your offices cleaned. You you hire yeah. Janet King. So we'll start with an overview of the season. So we'll do our season overview. And this is the 10th race of the 2002 season. Uh, and it is a week after the race at Fontana. Uh, so Jack Sprague, after that race, became the point leader. He has a 32-point lead over Jason Keller. And Jason Keller's teammate, rookie Scott Riggs, is in third. And Riggs had uh, just won the race at Fontana the week before. So uh, this is also Jack Sprague's first season uh, in the uh, – Bush series because he had been in trucks forever with Hendrick Motorsports, won three yep. championships, and then decided they finally decided to move him up because I guess uh, he was going to be. They figured he'd be their next Cup driver. So, uh, looking into the future, that did not work out very well. But he did have a good year that year in the Bush series. He finished fifth in points. He won a race at Nashville. So, yeah. Um, Scott Riggs is on fire though. He's won two of the last three races. He won his first race at Nashville. Uh, then the race in between Nashville and Fontana was that Talladega race where everybody crashed, yep. um, which is pretty crazy. Jason Keller won that race. I think there was only three cars in the lead lap. Uh, so that was, if you've never seen that crash, look it up on YouTube. It's a big one that takes out almost every single car in the field. So it's infamous. Yeah. There's I mean, guys, I, I think eight or nine laps down that finish in the top 10. So yep. it's a really interesting race. Infamous. I think as you said, I, I think like Tim Fita was in that race and he's like not going to run the whole race. And then he has like this emotional moment at the end. So if you want to feel good story, they were going to, they were only, they, they didn't have enough money to run the full race. So they were going to run as long as they could. Uh, and then they decided everybody dropped out. Yeah. They dropped, so they, they find they, I guess they got tires from other teams that dropped out and ran the full race, finished third. So it's pretty crazy. But that's a cool race too. But that's not the race we're talking about today. No, we're talking about this one. And what's funny about this race specifically is it's a it's a Richmond weekend, so obviously it's going to be like a two day show. And unfortunately, on one of those days, qualifying day, it gets rained out. So we're going to set them up by points. So our point leader Jack Sprague is going to start on the pole. Jason Keller is going to be second. And unfortunately, a newcomer to NASCAR at this time, Christian Fittipaldi would fail to make this race. He was driving a number 30 Mike's Hard Lemonade Chevy and was actually one of the fastest cars in practice. And that's right, he had a corporate sponsor and he did not make this race. Shame. Qualifying rained out. The last car to make the field was Johnny Benson's 31 Whelan Chevy. They were 43rd in the owner points, so they got the last spot. But 
because uh, they would set on owner points at this time, although qualifying locking in was not based on owner points, I don't believe. It was provisionals, right? You had a certain number of provisionals you could use. Yeah, they. it's first set by owner owner points to get the, I guess, what was it, like 35 or 38 cars? Um, and then they would set, I guess, the last five by provisional if it was just 38 cars. It's the same way they do it now, again, when, it, when yeah. it's rained out. They've kind of gone back to that, so... Which, in all in all fairness, it is fair, you know, like it reward the people who are consistently competing. I mean, it makes sense, yeah. Then, then we arrive at a charter system, which <laughs> the future, move, man. It's move, we're move. not in the future yet, Mark. We're yeah. in two thousand two. Moving on, uh, the next pre race storyline is that Ricky Hendrick has returned to the number five GMAC car. That's right, uh, Rick Hendrick's son, Ricky. Um, he missed had missed the prior six races due to injury. Uh, Ron Hornaday Jr. filled in for him. Uh, but he wanted to come back, so on the Tuesday of that week, they did a 200-lap test at Concord Speedway uh, that his father told him he had to complete before he would let him drive again. Um, Ron Hardy Jr., solid fill-in driver, by the way. He filled in at Hendrick multiple times, and he had a great career as being a fill-in Bush Series driver while he was a truck series guy, even later in the 2000s. Uh, he does not have a relief driver for this race. He's going to run the full race. But they said in pre-race that he had Randy LaJoy's seat stuffed with padding to give him some extra space because he had some bruises and stuff. I, I don't know if they actually meant like Ron Hornaday because he had been subbing for him. Like I don't know why he would have Randy LaJoy's seat. Uh, I, I, I'll i elaborate a little more on that. So I think he meant like the LaJoy seating company, Randy LaJoy's like seats oh, okay. that he made. Yeah. Um, cause that was, uh, I think another thing Randy wanted to focus on was making these seats and his were at the time were pretty revolutionary because of the whole transition with safety as, uh, the, the first mind of innovation. Gotta and, have a side hustle, mindset. man. It's all about side hustles. Mm -hmm. See, it's, it's you gotta have an exit TVs. strategy. You can't be a pro athlete forever, folks. You have to, there's life after sports. So learn from Randy LaJoy. Yeah. Uh, the next pre-race storyline is that Jimmy Spencer is in this race, Mr. Excitement. Uh, he's currently a full-time cup driver driving that number 41 target Dodge for Chip Ganassi racing with Felix Sabatis, their first season with that car. Uh, but he's going to run this Bush race in a Chevy with no logos on it for James Finch. They had no Chevy logos on that car at all. Uh, I'm not sure what the deal was with that. If they had no, uh, money from sponsors or if it was a stipulation of having Spencer in the car, they had to remove the logos. But he is the winner of the previous two Richmond Bush races. He swept the races in 2001, but qualifying rained out. He has to start 27th. But it's okay, because in pre-race, he says that his car is badass coming off the corner, and he's going to be coming through the field. I like how in pre-race, he's being interviewed in his cup garage, too. Because I guess cup practice had just ended. Yeah. Because everything got pushed back because of the rain, because qualifying mm -hmm. was earlier that day, so everything got pushed back a little bit. And it's tough two-day show it's a very compact schedule um and i think also to to kind of like piggyback off the chevy uh chevy logos i don't think finch ever really got too much manufacturer support with chevy so i don't think he ran too many uh, logos in 2002 but then he finally swapped to dodge in 2003 i believe was if i'm not mistaken i think mistaken. it was three yeah because jamie mcmurray drove a bunch of races for him so and they got the help from ganassi so they switched to dodge yeah and they ran the 09 and the cup series that was a was a dodge as well mm -hmm. so makes sense um, going down the line, we also have to talk about this big piece of news. And, uh, we, we, we hear a lot about like track surfaces and, you know, textures and layers and things. Well, at Richmond in 2002, they were messing around with the track surface and they applied a new sealer. And a lot of the drivers were concerned about the amount of grip in the track, especially in the corners. And Richmond's a very technical track, but you need to have grip the entire time around that track. And uh, Mark, I think Jeff Green said it best. He was not happy with the way the track, the conditions of the track were for the oh, driver. Oh, we'll get to that later in the race. We're going to hear all from yeah. Mr. Jeff Green. But one one thing you will see is the amount of smoke that guys make when they spin out because of the new sealer. It's unbelievable. Like how Yeah, it's like yellow smoke too. It's crazy watching the smoke go up in the air. Um, the other things we have to mention is that teams are allotted three sets of tires for the race and the pit road speed limit is 40 miles Per hour all the way down the long pit road going from turn four all the way down to turn one and that leads us to our favorite segment of these race reviews 
Strange starters. Strange starters. James, lead us off, man. Who is our first strange starter? It's a short list in comparison it's to some a short other races list. we've done. But nah, but it's got some substance to it. I mean, let's start off with Jeff Green, uh, 2000 Bush Series champion, making a rare appearance in the Bush Series in 2002. He's a full-time Cup driver right now in the number 30 AOL Chevy in for Richard Childress Racing. Tonight, he'll be driving the number 21 Rockwell Automation Chevy for RCR. And he did run a limited schedule in 2002, shared the car. I believe he had some, I'm not sure exactly who he shared the car with. I can always I go wanna to say car. it was Jay Sauter. I would say Jay, and I think Jeff Purvis had a shot at 2002. I'm not sure, but I, I can always check that. Purvis was in the 37, I believe, full time still. Was that when he won yes. the race at Texas that got rained out? Mm, because no. there was a year he won the race at Texas when it got rained out, and it was his Gr only, it was his only finish like above 20th the whole year. Really? Or something like that, yeah. And then he ended up getting let go, but that's for another day. Yeah, um, it was actually Jay Sauter. Jay Sauter sh uh, shared the ride with him in 2002. Yeah, so they were, he starts third. They were third in the owner points. So they were doing a pretty good job trying to get that owner's title. And that was really a thing that Richard Childress started was, I'm going to get multiple drivers in my car and try and win the owner's title. He was one of the first ones to do it. And in 2003, uh, Kevin Harvick and Johnny Sauter would pull that off. They would win the owner's title. And I believe that was the first ever year you had a different driver and owner champion in the yeah. series. Yeah. And it's crazy because like we did we do talk about this like very shortly about developmental drivers, but you, you wanna also talk about like developmenting a cup driver, you know, usually getting those laps on a Saturday. The 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 bush race is always good to transition to Sunday. So for Jeff Green to get some time as a uh, he's not really a cup series rookie at this point. He's had a lot of starts, but you know, his first full season with RCR, you know, Richard's gonna feed him into the Bush series, give him more track time, which is good. And our next train starter is good old Mikey Waltrip, and he is driving his classic number 99 Aaron's Dream Machine Chevy for his own team, Michael Waltrip Racing. Uh, he ran a limited schedule pretty much every year, and this is still when he was very competitive. He was winning races every year uh, in the Bush Series, so uh, love that Aaron's Dream Machine, classic paint scheme. Uh, that was so the first year of it, I think, like this... Uh was this the uh, iconic? No, that was 2003 was the purple one. This is still the, the, the classic white mm -hmm. with classic the red. Aaron's dream machine. Mm -hmm. So going to our third starter on the list, Jimmy Spencer in the number one yellow freight Chevy for Phoenix Racing. Yes, he ran a limited bush schedule starting in 2001 with Phoenix Racing. And I don't know why we'd put him on this list as being strange, but you know what? He is just strange every time he's in the bush series. And when he comes to tracks where he's really successful, so Charlotte, Richmond, Bristol, these are really good tracks for Jimmy in the Bush car, and you always expect him to win. And next guy is Josh Richardson, and he is driving the number 11 Smuckers Toppings Ford for Brett Bodine Racing, which is a very weird team because I don't think Brett really ran a Bush car very often. But they ran nine races that year, uh, and they had a massive corporate sponsor in Smuckers, which is, I don't know what Smuckers' parent company is, I'm not sure, but they put the Smuckers branding on the car, and I don't know who Josh Richardson is, obviously didn't last long, so mm -mm. Uh, does not work out for him, but he will he will come up again later in the race. He's, he's involved in some action later in the race. At the action track. Uh, next, David Rudiman in the number 87 Geico Direct Chevy for Nemco Motorsport. Uh, now, David Rudiman, this is before his uh, partnership with Daryl Waltrip in the truck series. This is uh, David Rudiman basically straight out of uh, Florida coming up to the uh, cup level. He was actually in Morgan McClure's pipeline kind of as a developmental driver to be in the cup series in the number 04, not the four. Uh, but he ended up doing about seven races for Nemco and actually had two top five finishes, uh, which actually would lead him to more races in 2003 with Nemco. Uh, so I actually got that wrong. <clears throat> so I put seven bush races for Nemco. That was in 2003. Uh, 2002, oh. he only ran <clears throat> four races. So, uh, But it was a weird car because I guess like <clears throat> his family bought the car from Nemco. 
huh. to field him, but they put the 87 on it and the Nemco actually brought a crew to help them operate the car. So it's like one of those weird, like we could do a video one day and all the weird times that like people have swapped points or swapped numbers or, you know, it's, it's, it's really confusing, but that was a weird one. But this is actually David Rudiman's first ever uh, Bush series start. And that's like the coolest fact of this one. It's his first one. Uh, next one, Brian Vickers. Mark, take it away. Brian Vickers is driving the number 40 EMP U.S. Army Dodge for his family-owned team. Uh, they ran 21 races that year. This is before the Brian Vickers as we know him as the Red Bull Toyota driver. But he ran 21 races. Uh, he had only one top 10, but he did enough to impress actually Ricky Hendrick who once he decided to stop racing, uh, elected to choose Brian Vickers to replace him in the five car. And Brian Vickers wins the 2003 driver championship. So definitely a good pick, but kind of a weird one seeing how he didn't really have the results. But I haven't watched every race from 2002. So there could have been times, I don't know, maybe Brian was up in the top five and then got wrecked and showed a lot of promise. So, but uh, he, he, we all know that Brian goes on to have a, a great uh, career. Yeah, just from like knowing his his uh, background in ASA, being this his like first real full like jump into NASCAR, not too bad of a, a rookie effort. Speaking of rookies, how about this one? Fresh face Casey Kane in the number ninety eight Channel Lock Ford for Robert Yates Racing. That's right, Casey Kane is a developmental driver for Robert Yates Racing. He, in he's one of the OG development OGs. drivers. Like, yeah, it's like. Like, I feel like um, this was like uh, in the line of like a Kenny Irwin Jr., Tony Stewart, Jeff Gordon. Let's find this next open wheel talent that we can cultivate into a stock car champion. You know what I mean? And no doubt Casey is like a great talent in uh, open wheel dirt racing. And he basically dives into NASCAR this, this year. He makes 20 starts. And didn't really get much uh, with it. In 2003, he actually ended up signing with Aikens Motorsports for the full season. And with that, caught the eye of Ray Everham. Then he would become the successor to Bill Elliott in number nine car. But right now, he's just Casey Kane in a number 98. Uh, and uh, we have two more. Our next one is Johnny Benson Jr. Mr. Johnny Benson Jr., the pride of Michigan. He's driving the number 31 Whelan Engineering Chevy for Marsh Racing. Long-time association of Whelan with that team and with the number 31, still sponsoring the number 31 core, uh, Cadillac DPI in IMSA with the Whelan sponsorship. Uh, he was a full-time cup driver and just ran a few races every year. Uh, 1995 Bush Series champion, and uh, he's going to uh, play uh, in the race later as well. We're going to have some uh, some action with Johnny Benson. Mm-hmm. That, that's for sure. Finally, uh, we're going to have to throw it to Mark Green in the number 38. Great clips forward for Aikens Motorsports. For Brad Aikens, uh, longtime Xfinity Series car owner. Uh, he was substituting for Christian Elder, who was injured earlier in the season. Elder would make a couple of starts with the team, but unfortunately uh, would not continue the full season. Mark Green stepped up and actually finished the season with the team. Uh, didn't have that great of results, but with Mark Green being in this race, you have Jeff and David. You have three greens in this race, and all, that's a good bush race. All three green brothers. That's how you know this is a great bush race. So mm -hmm. moving on to the broadcast info. So this is a Fox broadcast. Granted, it is broadcast on FX, um, but it is a Fox and broadcast. If, if you don't have FX, you should just call 1-800-FX-FX-NOW, and you'll get FX. That's what you're supposed to do, Mark. Remember that. I don't think that number works anymore. Uh, <laughs> no, no, I don't uh, think many 800 numbers work. But uh, up in the Hollywood Hotel uh, hosting the pre-race, we have Chris Myers and Jeff Hammond. And then Jeff Hammond will later on be at the cutaway car, giving us all kinds of information on uh, mechanical failures that happen during the race and, and why certain things happen. In the booth, we have the classic lineup of Mike Joy, Daryl Waltrip, and Larry McReynolds. At this time, they really just used at all the companion races. They just used the same crew as the cup race. Sometimes they'd have like a guest uh, commentator, but most of the time it was just those three guys. So we also have a classic pit road. So the classic pit road of the editor, the editor of Speedway Illustrated Magazine, Doctor Dick Bergeron, wearing his awesome. What do you call those hats that he wears? I can't. I don't. I don't know what those are called. I forgot what they're called. Yeah, like those English hats. 
Yeah, you it's wear, like, what uh, you wear when you play golf, you know? Yeah, because you're in Wales and the wind blows, but it won't blow that hat up. That's that's aerodynamic. Exactly. And he is joined by Matt Yoakum and yeah. Steve Burns. R.I.P. for Mr. Steve Burns. We miss him more and more every day. I believe just a little while ago was the anniversary of uh, Steve Burns passing. So uh, always sad. It just sucks because it's like it's like right on top of his birthday. It's like one week apart. Yeah. It's like bummer. And we miss Steve uh, Burns. I also. We do. I'll also correct myself. Uh, I did say David Green was in this race. David is not in this race. No, he's not. I, I, yeah, I was just thinking that. Actually, I'm I like, apologize I don't, about that. This was a weird year where he was kind of between like rides. Yeah, because he's always been a staple in the uh, the Bush series, uh, like at least making yearly starts. But you know, this is a weird year where he's not. But doesn't it doesn't diminish from the talent pool within this race, especially in the veteran side of the talent pool. Yeah, this is a stacked field, so I'm looking forward to the race. And that brings us to the start of the race. So, where, 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 Where's the DW saying to boogity, boogity, boogity? Let's go racing, boys. And right after this race starts, we really get um, craziness. So Jeff Green is like, hey, I'm really racy right now, and I'm going to try and take the lead from third in turn two. And Scott Riggs is coming with me. And... Riggs gets into the back bumper of Green, turns him sideways, Randy the Joy nearly spins out in turn four, and we're one lap into the race, and we've almost had five accidents. So they're basically trying to bump and run each other for the win on lap one. Nobody told them. They forgot. Like, I think uh, Larry McReynolds says nobody told them there was a zero at the end of the two and the five for number of laps. You know? uh, so <laughs> I, I thought that was clever because they, they are acting like it is a 25-lap heat race. Uh, and I think that's kind of funny, too, that Jeff Green just – did this i mean all all give uh, none given all driven he just ca- doesn't care he just wants the lead he doesn't care that he's third he feels like he's got the best car but you know i don't i don't think that's a mature thing for him to be doing especially as a cup driver you know what i mean yeah and that leads us to mike joy say that this is the kind of start that sells tickets and then through the first like 20 laps of the race you'll hear daryl walter multiple times say it's like it's like the winston open race like that's what it reminds them of them almost just like i just want to win this race so bad that they're knocking each other the way a 20 lap race you know it's crazy that it's so intense um this early in this race i don't know what it is like the the fact that qualifying was like rained out and everyone's like a little antsy and jittery but like man everyone's so aggressive early in this race and lap two randy lajoy drives way too deep into turn one washes up into jeff green almost wrecks both of them and our pole sitter jack sprague is already back to 12th and he did mention in the pre-race that they really struggled with their qualifying program. And everyone has their qualifying setup because they couldn't do yeah. anything to the cars. So it's not really surprising that he's already fallen back. But they have good race runs. You know, you expect to see Jack Sprague back up there. Mm-hmm. Um, Jason Keller gets the lead on lap three. And then on lap 13, Jack Sprague's in the wall. So he's not going to be in the top five. <laughs> so. Yeah, so much for a race run there, Mark. Uh, he had a little bit of help, though. Uh, going into the wall, Kevin Crub got down on the apron and uh, got loose, and then just hit Classic. Sprague. But that left Classic front tire on the apron got tire. loose, and Sprague goes multiple laps down trying to uh, fix the damage on his car. But you got to keep running because you're the point leader. You got to get max points, you know. So yeah, but that that uh, net zero Chevy is shortened up for the rest of the night, and that is the first of many cautions we'll be discussing in this race because there's a lot of them. <laughs> Lap 20, we go back to green. Jason Keller checks out into his own zip code in about a lap and a half. And then on lap 23, we get another caution. Johnny Benson in the wall, and he is pretty shook up. Took him a while to get out of the car. He doesn't look too good. Yeah, I wouldn't say he shook up. I'd say he probably has a couple cracked ribs. Uh, A lot of drivers like Greg Biffle use this early caution to come into the pits and make Big adjustments. I mean, lots of turns on the track bar and wedge wrenches in these cars. Uh, Unfortunately, Benson was taken to the hospital. Fortunately, he had only bruised ribs and a possible concussion. Unfortunately, he would miss the next three cup races. Joe Nemechek would fill in for him the very next race, which is tomorrow night at... uh, Actually, no, it was 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 rained out. Yeah, it was the same track, but it was rained out, actually. I forgot about that. It was pushed to Sunday. Those were always weird when they pushed Richmond. They had Richmond at day in the daytime. It happened in two thousand seven too. I remember just being weirded out by. It. I think it's because they always hype it up with the night aspect, and you're and you're you you just think the race is going to be a night race, and you're anticipating that, and then you're you're let down. 
because it's a day race. And not to say a day race is a letdown. It just changes it. But in the end, Johnny Benson, we're glad you're doing okay. Glad you're healthy. Lap 32, back to green. Lap 35, caution. Uh, Josh Richardson and Mark Green, uh, the Smuckers car was just modified into a hatchback. It is destroyed. It looks like a Honda Civic hatchback now. And he would retire from the race. So. You ever drop a, drop a bottle of Schmuckers? That's what happened to uh, Josh Richardson's right there. Exactly. Yeah. Lap 46, back to green. Lap 51, caution. Because cautions breed cautions. Never forget that. But this one's huge. It's the big one. Jeff Green, Todd Bodine, Tony Raines, Jeff Purvis, Casey Mears, Tim Sauter, Shane Hall, and Hank Parker Jr. are all involved in this massive chain reaction wreck. And it's one of those wrecks where you see guys way in the back spinning out trying to slow mm-hmm. down before they even get to the crash. So it all started when Randy LaJoy got turned around uh, by Tony Raines, which caused a big chain reaction. I don't think anybody meant to wreck anyone. Uh, Jeff no. Green, his car was destroyed after Todd Bodine apparently ran into him, uh, to which Jeff Green said, well, Todd told me his brakes broke and his brakes must break a lot because he runs into me a lot. And he then proceeded to say, uh, right tracks jump. Um, yeah. So, you know, Jeff Green is, uh, never, never not to be blunt in the heat of the moment. Ironic though, that isn't this, uh, a year before he gets like that. And it's that incident with Kevin Harvick and then uh, loses his ride at RCR? I believe so. Countdown begins. Anyways, uh, we get all this cleaned up. Everyone gets their cars fixed as best as they can. And we're going to go back to green at lap 65. And now we're starting to see a high groove come in here. We're starting to see some side-by-side action. Can you imagine, Mark? People can race side-by-side now. They don't have to hit each other and wreck all the time. Maybe we can get like a few less cautions in this race. Yeah, even we get some racing. Lap 76, Bobby Hamilton Jr. takes the lead. He's got a really fast number 35 Marines forward. So he takes the lead from Jason Keller. And then lap 87, Jimmy Spencer's all the way up to fourth after starting 27th. And he can he's passing people on the outside. His car is working all over the place. And he's running down Scott Wimmer for third. Then on lap 102, carry on Earnhardt. Uh, I can't remember. I got to watch it again. I got to pull it up. I can't remember why he crashed. I don't know if he just got loose and hit the wall, but... His car is destroyed. His 1010 220 car yeah. is destroyed. Um, pretty pretty fire paint scheme, though. And this is when we get one of the weirdest things that I have never seen before since in NASCAR. Jimmy Spencer's team drops the car off the jacks. He drives forward, and the rear end of the car falls to the ground. I've it, never I, never I, seen I that happen before. Yeah, that's the weirdest thing I think I've ever seen. And, you know, since Jimmy Spencer isn't really mm-hmm. running for points and all he cares about is winning – his, his night's done. Yeah, they're not oh. going to try and go back out. So, And then we uh, find out from Jeff Hammond that it was just a really simple bracket, but a $30 part that just that just broke. Give Jeff Hammond an Emmy right now for his Ford cutaway car. Seriously. Cutting edge technology. And then on lap 114, oh, sorry, we went back to green briefly, and then there was another caution. Um, uh, Lyndon Amix in the wall and that Dr. Pepper car. Uh, Lyndon Amick, weird, weird guy, weird career. But he, mm-hmm. he backs his car in the wall. So there really is a lot of talk about the sealer and how guys are just getting loose on the bottom, especially if they touch the apron, how different the grip level is, and they just spin out and go into the wall. Very, very much reminded me of like a Bristol race with the old Bristol with the one groove where guys would get out of shape and then just hit the wall. So Richmond, just like the opposite of Dover. You're going up the track into the wall, you know? So Yeah, I just, I don't know what it is. If it's the paint or if it's just the sealer itself or like the transition, but I, I don't know. It doesn't, doesn't really look that uh, good for the sealer though. Uh, it doesn't, doesn't post rave reviews. Though we go get back, we do get back to racing at lap 123. Bobby Hamilton Jr. is back in control of this race, but Scott Wimmer, is it coming in that number 23 car? I think the no decals in the car make it faster because he is coming fast. No drag from the little little lips of the mm-hmm. decals, you know? Nothing. Exactly. But unfortunately, laps 127, yeah, we're under caution again. Casey Kane, unfortunately, now is in the wall. And he nobody helped him either. He just got loose. No. Yeah. So that that's where you got to just shake your head and be like, track traction sealer. Uh, lap 145, though, Brian Vickers. Uh, he is now running 11th. Can you imagine this rookie's running good? He started 36 way back in the pack. No owner points on this partial schedule. He's running running pretty good right now. He's very racy up in the 11th place. And a couple laps later, 
Every time in this race when they're trying to do a feature, there's a caution. Like every oh, yeah. time they're like, this Brian Vickers kid, boom, somebody's in the wall, you know. But lap 149 is a caution for debris just on the apron, just off the racing line, but they got to throw a caution. Uh, so with 100 laps to go, the question is, do you pit? Do you come and get your last mm-hmm. set of tires now and fill it with fuel to go to the end? Or do you wait and stay out? So down at PPC Racing... There's a bit of a an argument. Jason Keller decides to come in, but Scott Riggs decides that he's going to stay out. So Scott Riggs is going to stay on the racetrack. Jason Keller is going to come in. We'll see how that affects later in the race. See, that's where it's good to have two cars because then you can just have one car do one strategy, the other car do the other strategy, and just see how it unfolds. You don't have to kick yourself in the rear. So we'll go back racing. Uh, and then a few laps later, there's another caution. Uh, Ashton Lewis just spun out on the front stretch in a cloud of yellow smoke, uh, but nobody hit him. So miraculously, no one hits him, but so much smoke, we have to throw a caution. And as is the time of old, before the lucky dog rule, Tim Sauter managed to get his lap back by racing in front of the leader on the restart. Because back then, we mentioned this, and this is like our favorite thing to mention in old races. Back then, the lap car started on the inside. And you had to race the leader to get your lap back. And yep, so it was Tim Sauter in the number 19 Chevy got his lap back. I believe Jack Sprague makes, the, makes a couple up as well and actually gets back on the lead lap at some point in his modified. Yeah, he's, he's actually – he's pretty fast with like no deck lid on the back of that car. Uh, what I will say about Tim Sauter really quick, he's got the cool speed TV onboard camera, which is dope. I mean, why is – I don't know how Speed is sponsoring that little in-car shop, but that's pretty cool. Speed sponsored the whole car. It was yeah, Speed, I know. It was it's Speed like, Channel. It was like, what? <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, but it's like it's like this white car, so it's not really like prominent Speed logos until like you see it on the, the in-car, which is pretty cool. You know, Mark, you like to talk about highlights. We did get one decent highlight, and that was this one of David Rudiman at lap 180. Yeah, they just talked about David Rudiman and like, you know, kind of outlined what we talked about in Strange Starters, which is cool. Like, I like when they tell stories. And that's the cool thing about mm-hmm. these Bush series and truck series races especially is when they tell the stories of the small teams. So that one was really cool. Uh, then on lap 195, Scott Wimmer's crew chief, Booty Barker. Good old Booty Barker. Love Booty Barker. He gets Booty. interviewed and he gets asked, are you guys good to go on fuel? Because they did come in and pit at lap 149. And he said, I don't know if I have enough fuel, but I'm not stopping again. Now, that's just stuff they say, right? You are not. You don't want to tip your hand, right? So, Bo- Booty Barker is like the, the king of being sort of overdramatic towards the television reporter. You know what I mean? Like, he'll, he'll never tell them what's going on, really, on, on camera. But, like, probably, like, when the camera's off, I'll be like, yeah, we're probably short. But we'll see. Booty Barker's putting a face up. For, for Scott Wimmer at this point. Then we get another caution. Because why not, right? So lap 201, yep. there's another caution. As Mark Green blows a motor, lots of smoke. And now Scott Riggs is actually going to come in. He's going to give up. I believe he was in third. He's going to come in, get his final set of tires. And then 11 laps later, we're going to get another caution as he crashes. So... Didn't work out for Scott. We never know if the tire strategy would work out because he got wrecked. So this is now the 11th caution, by the way, which ties a record for Bush races at Richmond. But see, this is why I would applaud the PPC racing team for the 57 because this is what you wanted to do. You wanted to get in, get your service done, get out, let everything fall around you. You get the track position while everyone goes back in. And now they're back in the pack like Scott was. And when you're back in the pack, you're susceptible to something happen. And that's the thing is all these cautions have really played into Jason Keller's strategy. And he's the only one that we know is good on fuel. Mm-hmm. Like he's good on fuel. They, they say they've saved enough. There's been enough cautions. So they get back going. Bobby Hamilton Jr. pulls out to a massive lead. Jason Keller runs him down. But it'd be all for naught because about 15 laps short of the finish, Bobby Hamilton Jr. runs out of fuel. Or, but then it's later reported that they think he lost a motor because they're because mm. the crew chief said there's no way they could have been 15 laps short on fuel, so he might have lost a motor, or and that Jason, fueler's losing a job, and it goes green to the end. Jason Keller is your winner of mm. the 2002 Hardy's 250 at Richmond. 
That's right. Not the Carl's Jr. That's Hardee's because we're in the South. That's what's up. So yeah. Jason Keller, savvy veteran, takes his win. He won at Talladega a couple weeks prior, so he gets his second win of the season. And, and not only that, gets the point lead the back. point lead from Mr. Jack Sprague, who I mm-hmm. think he rebounded to finish – where did he finish? 18th. So he rebounded to finish 18th. Not bad. Which is which is pretty respectable. And it's unfortunately, though, for that team, if you look at their schedule, that's two weeks in a row where they had to fight back from adversity early on in the race. They spent the whole race fighting back. Like the, the wreck at Talladega, they had to fix the car, get it back on track. This race, they had to fix the car, get it back, and just soldier on. Where you got Jason Keller just out there getting maximum points. And when you got a year-long points battle you can't afford to have let alone one problem now you have back-to-back weeks where you have issues that's that's not good for the uh for the championship battle but good recovery though to get a top 20 out of it and a couple guys will highlight is kevin grubb gets a fifth place finish kind of out of nowhere michael waltrip fourth out of nowhere uh brian vickers seventh place in that family-owned dodge Scott Wimmer ends up eighth uh, with the with the strategy. Just kind of ran out of tires and kind of back had to, you know got passed by quite a few people. Jamie McMurray didn't talk about him all night. He finished ninth, and Tim Sauter got his lap back and finished tenth. His second straight top ten. Big day for Jim Sauter. Tim Jim, yeah. Tim Sauter. And sorry, our second place finisher was Ashton Lewis. I uh, forgot to mention that. So he rebounded from that spin and ended up in second place. And this is probably one of our like favorite, though we probably don't look that like nerdy about it. But when we like look at a guy like Ashton Lewis, we we look at these races for him as like these are like his big races. I mean, he wasn't uh, a a consistent winner in the Xfinity series, but he was always an underdog that people liked. You know, you can relate him to the way people look at a guy like Jordan Anderson in the Truck Series today, like that one driver you just wish you could see do good if they had the opportunity. Um, and Ashton Lewis is always great to see. And he's got that, like, interesting sponsor because I've never seen the Civil Air Patrol uh, ever sponsor anything else as far as an armed forces. I've, I've never seen them anywhere else in, in stock car racing other than Ashton Lewis's car. Uh, interesting that uh, Jamie McMurray gets a top 10 out of this in that Clarence Brewer uh, car uh, because that's another big Xfinity team constantly uh, been in the series for years. Uh, and Jamie McMurray at this time has not taken that Ganassi uh, substitution ride for uh, Sterling Marlin. So we really don't know who he is. So, you know, he's building his name. There's a lot of like really great stories that like are in this field that we, and drivers that we just will know in the future become something, you know what I mean? Like they're going to prosper again to cup series win races. And it's cool to see them like as rookies in, in this light and in this race. Yeah, like guys like Greg Biffle, uh, you know, he finished third in this race. Brian Vickers, as we mentioned, Scott Wimmer, Jamie McMurray. These are all guys who are going to end up in Cup. David Rudiman, even. Uh, Kenny mm-hmm. Wallace is going to return to the Cup Series full time in 2003, albeit in a not very competitive car, but he will. Uh, Johnny Scott, Sauter, Casey Johnny Mears. Sauter, Casey Mears. Casey Mears. Scott Riggs will get there. Um, Casey K- Kane, also, obviously, will get there. Uh, Todd Bodine will get back up to Cup. Uh, and, and like, the, and it's, it's a great mix because you got like these young names in here, like we've mentioned, like Casey Kane, uh, Brian Vickers, Scott Wimmer, Jimmy McMurray. Then you got veterans, Keller. You got the Greens. You got Sauter. You got Bodine. You got even Tony Raines in this race, even though he doesn't really do much, but still, Tony Raines in the race. Other than get involved in a wreck, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. And he even said he's like, we've had that's, good, we've had good that's, cars. That's and, the thing about this race. Yeah, good cars and no luck. That's the thing about this race, man. Exactly. But but the thing about this race, man, it was a wreck fest. It's like look at the at the at the rundown, like the top twenty five basically are still running at the finish. Everyone else has issues. And if you look at the at the cup race the next night, so we really learned that, you know, the sealer on the track, people really felt affected uh what happened. And the next night, uh Michael Walter finishes tenth. So he finished fourth in the bush race, finishes tenth in the cup race, and Jeff Green finished eleventh. So Jeff Green maybe learned something from his experiences in the Bush race and was able to drive. Sorry, sorry, it was uh, it was pushed back to uh, Sunday uh, afternoon. To Sunday and was only two hundred and fifty mile laps <laughs> rather than five hundred. Says it was only two hundred and fifty laps. Did they shorten? The I race? mean, they, they did run. 
I think they ran a bit during – they ran a good chunk of it on Saturday night, and then they had to postpone it. But I don't know how much of it they ran Saturday night. I'm going to I'm gonna have to watch this race again. Oh, sorry. I'm looking at the wrong race. I'm sorry. I'm looking at the one from Fontana because I'm an idiot. So that is no bueno. Uh, Pontiac Excitement 400. My my apologies. Uh, no, uh, Nobody that finished in the top 10 in the Bush race finished in the top 10 in the Cup race. Jimmy Spencer finished 10th, though. So he made he might have learned a little bit uh, from the Bush race to get a 10th place finish. Uh, and Joe Nemechek subbing for, as we mentioned, the aforementioned, sorry, injured Johnny Benson. He finished 12th in the Cup race, a last second fill in driver. So good to see Joe up there. Yeah, and you know, like you said, a fill-in driver because like he lost his ride, his full-time ride with Travis Carter earlier that um, year, a few weeks before. Uh, basically, Travis gave him the option to leave because there was no sponsor because Kmart went bankrupt, uh, and then he gets this ride, and yet Travis Carter got uh, Frank Kemmel to drive with the pork, uh, the other white meat car, and uh, they made the field. Unfortunately, finished dead last, but still, everyone's still trucking. And the other. Uh... Interesting thing is, sorry, I'll just mention from that cup race, that's the race where Steve Grissom finished eighth in the Petty car, just randomly. I remember just seeing like that random stat as an outlier for years. And like Steve Grissom had a top 10 in the cup series in 2002. It's crazy how like, it's it's like, you know, anyone could run these races well. All the cars were really good, you know, like competitive and the, the competition level was, was, was pretty equal. It was just about like how you said, Mark, you know, if you had luck on your side, you can get a good run out of it. Mm -hmm. And it was true for everyone at every level. Yeah. And it was, I don't know, it was just a very competitive time. Like, as we mentioned before, you know, there was just so many competitive cars, competitive teams, so much money flowing. Like I mentioned in the intro, like it was just unbelievable. Just, just guys, just sponsors making it rain on NASCAR teams, which is not what you see today. Unfortunately, now we, now we're living in the time of the pay driver. Um, yeah. Pay driver reigns supreme because the, the money's just not there for a lot of young talent. So overall, I, would, sorry, uh, I was going to say, I was, your point. I was going to say, I'd love to talk to Dale Jr. about like when he was, uh, I know he didn't really talk numbers with Budweiser, but you know, I'd like to either talk to him or even like the people at Budweiser when they were like trying to spend money back then. Like, what was it like? Cause like they, you look at a sponsor like them, that's like the top tier, uh, uh, amount of sponsorship dollars where they're basically saying it's an unlimited budget. What do you need? Tell us what you need and we'll pay it. Where here it's it's a little bit of a different story, but still a good amount of money for the programs that are are running to help them run at the level that they are at and as polished as they are. They were really stout teams back in the day. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I think even you'll hear the one thing with Dale Jr. is remember in 2008 when he went to Hendrick, you hear that they were lining up sponsors to sponsor him. And it was some unbelievable, it was like 20 million just to come to the table, you know, to even talk to them. So yeah, kind of, kind of ridiculous, but this was a time back then, man, when it was just, God, it was great. Every, everyone had sponsors except Scott Wimmer. And it was, it was just what a time to be alive, man. Yeah. But that leads us into, we have to rate the race. Out of 10, what would you rate the 2002 Hardy's 250? Hmm. Uh, I'll go first. So I'm going to go with a 7.9. I'm going to, it's close to an eight. That's not quite an eight, but it's 7.9. Uh, what I like about it, first off, with this recording of it, you get a lot of great content on, on, on the coverage. Uh, I, for, I forgot it's exactly who uh, uploaded it. I don't know if it was uh, Dave W or... Uh, uh, what what specific YouTube channel we watched it from? But it was a really good recording uh, that they had. Had the full pre race, the full forty five minute mm -hmm. pre race, which I, I watched that, the whole thing. It's so rare to find those with the older races, like from like two thousand two. Uh, and I always liked those because they were funny. Uh, and there's a lot of great stories too. And that's what Fox really did a great job of was telling the stories of of the drivers and the teams and and even it, the people on the teams and breaking down roles. It it really. Uh, opened up what NASCAR was and kind of like peeled it back. It wasn't just racing on track. These were people and they, they were doing this for a reason. And I think that's really great about Fox coverage. The racing is intense. It's exciting. You never know what's going to happen. And what I love about this kind of Richmond racing is strategy. 
uh, understanding, you know, okay, we're going to have to probably go green for a hundred laps. We need to make sure we have enough fuel and save our tires and we're good. And that's kind of what happened though. There weren't really a lot of long green runs in this race. Uh, it's still, had a lot of variables of strategy and uh, different different appeals so i liked it 7.9 so i'm going to give this race a six and the reason i'm going to give it a six is because it it, it loses some strange starter appeal for me um mm. but and and we really with with bobby hamlin jr's motor letting go we really got robbed of the finish that we deserved which was him and jason keller going at it for the last 15 laps so that was that was tough, uh, but you know it had some. Int- it had an interesting top ten. Uh, it had cup drivers not really mattering at all, which is I always bring up races like this when people make the argument that cup drivers shouldn't be allowed in the Xfinity series. Yes, they should because look at how many races back then they never even factored in to the results, especially in the nineties. Other well, other than Mark Martin, but <laughs> just remember, yeah. like we watched a race from the from Bristol in ninety six and. I don't even think any of the cup drivers finished in the top 10. Like, no, I they mean, were just like that, not doing great, you know? It, and it just showed to, you know, especially back here in this time, the strengths of these teams competing week in and week out in the Xfinity series. And these cup guys would come in, you know, for these so off appearances with their teams that didn't run week in and week out in the Xfinity series. And they couldn't compete the same at the same capacity. Um, uh, uh, and it's changed a lot, you know, like the privateer teams that we see like Bruco and PPC, you know, they're not there anymore. And obviously it's mainly cup teams in the Xfinity series. And there are those Xfinity series teams that are, you know, strength holds and consistently there, but it's not what it was. And hopefully you can get back to it. I feel like a resurgence is coming though. It's all about, you know, it's all about dollar signs now. It's all about getting it more affordable and, you know, allowing smaller teams to compete, you know, and not mm-hmm. need to buy motors from, you know, expensive motors from expensive teams. And, you know, like, look at what the truck series has done with the, with the Ilmore engine and, and providing, obviously like they've, they've had, there's arguments that can be made about the reliability of that motor, but it has made it a lot more affordable for the teams, at least from the outside looking in, it's made it more affordable. So all in all, I give it a six. You gave it a seven point nine, so it's an average of about a seven, uh, which yeah. is a pretty, which is a pretty solid race. That's like a B plus race. Yeah, and I think any of these, uh, <clears throat> I'll be honest. I think we picked a dollar one of the Bush races, if I'm gonna be honest, because like if you look at some through the mid nineties, the finishes are <laughs> outrageous. They're like wacky, like last lap passes, crash into the finish. Even there's a couple in the uh, early two thousands where it's like close almost bumper to bumper to bumper in turn four coming down the white flag. Um, but you know, even still, this is a great race because there's a lot of action throughout the race. You can't just rate the race on the last lap, but I do agree with Mark. Sometimes you want to see a battle for the finish. You want to see something brew. That's the thing. Like I, I would like to see that battle at the end, but overall it was a decent race. So I give it a six, 7.9 from James. So not, not a bad race at all. It's definitely one that's worth checking out uh, if you've got mm-hmm. extra time on your hands, especially these days. Uh, I've been watching <laughs> old races. It's a lot of fun to check them out online. Mm-hmm. So go for it. Thank you to – I'm just going to look up uh, who uploaded it. I can't remember. So I'm, yeah. I'm going to look it up real quick. I got $2 on DW. Come on. Come up for me. It was uploaded by King Cuervo 88. Ah, King Cuervo. So thank you very much to King Cuervo 88 for uploading this race for us to watch. We enjoyed watching it, enjoyed reviewing it. And if you have not already, you can subscribe to Flashback to the Track on YouTube and on your favorite podcast app. Uh, we are on a lot of them. We're on Spotify. We're on Google Podcasts. So Look into that if you have not, uh, if you enjoy the audio version. Um, Trying to get more creative with the video version, doing different things. This will be the first race review that we've done as a video version. <clears throat> so, Yeah, should be an interesting one for everyone to, to check out. Do you know that uh, it's a lot harder to and takes more time to edit a video than an audio podcast? Crazy, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's because the, the, the visuals, you know, it's easy to mess with audio, but visuals. Yeah, so it's taking pitch. me a lot longer to get those done, but it's a labor of love. I love love. Do you love love? Oh, he finished 16th. That was cute. Yeah. Yeah, it was good. 
<laughs> but thanks so much for watching, guys. Really appreciate it. Once again, um, corporate sponsors. I know you're not spending money on the NASCAR Xfinity Series anymore like you were in the early 2000s, but if you want to sponsor us, like we're available. Like I already use this Gatorade water bottle every day, everywhere I go. It's got my name written on it. You could, you might as well give me some money for drinking out of it, because you know we're getting, yeah, you know, we're getting more and more famous every week. When you know we're up from like 80 views to 85, so you know, growth. Give us some money, you know. Yeah, I mean, shoot, why why doesn't Geico give us some money? That'd be great. Yeah, uh, shout out to Geico too. Like the fact that Ty Dillon on his iRacing setup has pieces of paper printed off that just say save 15% or more on car insurance, it's like stapled up on the wall behind him. Send him some stickers. You guys have lots of money. Like send yeah. him some stickers, please. Send, send me some stickers for my rig. I'll put, I'll, maybe I'll record myself racing for once. There you go. Record yourself racing. That's It's all about getting content out there. Uh, final thing I'll say is let the cup guys race in the Xfinity series. America's a land of opportunity. Come on, let them race. Yeah, I get bushwhacking, but I mean, straight up ex exiling them. Nah, it's just it's just not right. Let people compete, man. That's what America. That's what America was founded on. Mm -hmm. You know. So. Yep. But we will leave you with that. Thank you guys so much for listening to Flashback to the Track and watching on YouTube. It's been a lot of fun to uh, record this for you guys and, and make these podcasts. So, really appreciate it. Bye, have a beautiful time. Mm -hmm.